Well, hello, it's David Old here, and we are at the very end of an incredibly exciting GAFCON 2018 here in Jerusalem, uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, treading the steps that, that Jesus has trod 2,000 years ago. It's been an incredibly huge week, and I am joined here at the close by Archbishop Foley Beach, who is, I need to get this right, he is the, the primate of the Anglican Church in North America and now just announced at the conference the chairman of the GAFCON Primates Council. That's incredibly uh, exciting. Uh, welcome, Foley. Thank you. Now, uh, that's a huge announcement that we just had at the, at the auditorium. Uh, there was massive applause, uh, and Ben Quashie was announced as well as your general secretary. So that's a, 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 almost the next generation being brought in to move this movement on. Uh, it's exciting, I imagine a bit daunting as well. What are you most looking forward to over the next uh, five or ten years as you, as you lead this movement forward? There are billions of people that don't know Christ. And most of them are young people. So what I'm looking forward to, and, and Ben Kwashi, Archbishop Kwashi, is, has the same mindset, is what can we do to empower our churches to reach the young people in our nations? What are you, what are you doing in the uh, Anglican Church in North America about that? Well, one of the things is we're, we're, we're trying to plant churches near college campuses or where young people hang out. And we're finding that when we do that, it's amazing how they grow. Uh, young people are, are very interested in, in the gospel message itself, but also in, in what we offer in Anglicanism. Yeah. What, what is it that's distinctive about Anglicanism uh, that you can offer um, through the ACNA? Well, it, basically the uh, evangelical preaching and teaching of the Word of God, uh, spirit-filled worship, and then the, the whole richness of our Catholic history and tradition. And we, we bring all those together. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but, yeah. but we actually do. And uh, what young people are seeming to be drawn to is the connection with history. You know, we have such fractured communities, such fractured families, and to be able to connect in to a sense of worship of God that's been going on for literally thousands of years now, uh, they, they, they're drawn to it. That's great, that's great. It's almost as though the millennials are, are back out, aren't they seeking some sort of cultural anchor uh, to, to go back to after all the modernism that, that, that they've gone through. And church planting is a big part of the agenda as well, isn't it? So what's going on there? Well, we've, we've been planting, uh, last year we planted uh, one church a week. I think this year, uh, if I remember the st statist statistics, we actually have our provincial council uh, meeting tomorrow. I think we're a little over one church every two weeks uh, for this past year. Um, but that's a, a huge part of what we're doing. I used to be, well, and I still am, I'm still a, a big believer in personal evangelism. I'll talk to people in restaurants or in the elevator or wherever. Um, but I have found when we plant churches, for not only is it a New Testament model, but God uses it in amazing ways to reach people that, that have been untouched by the church. That's very, very exciting. Now, it is the end of GAFCON week, and there has been, as well as all this great talk about mission and, and pushing the gospel forward, which has clearly been the main agenda of what's been going on here, there's always been the politicking as well uh, going on behind, and I'm however going to resist the urge to get into that stuff. So I thought, I actually don't know Foley Beach the man. I don't know his story, I, I don't know what, what's gone on, and if I don't know, I'm thinking probably you don't know as well. So, so Foley, uh, actually, let's move away from all the politics. Tell us a bit about yourself. Where? Where did Foley Beach begin? Where, where was he born? Where did he grow up? I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. First eight years of my life seemed somewhat sane, uh, but they actually weren't. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was eight. I'm sorry to hear that. And um, in those days, it didn't matter what mom did, uh, the courts automatically gave custody of the children to the mother. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Well, well, my mother was a, an alcoholic, oh. a sex addict, and became a hippie of uh, okay. those 1960 era days. Flower power, that kind of thing. Exactly. So we moved uh, from place to place. I actually went to five different elementary schools. Within yeah. Georgia or wider? wider uh, mostly Georgia. Uh, we spent some wonderful time in Florida. Uh, that's one of my favorite times as a child. Um, but um, during the latter, latter times, I was pretty much a street kid on the streets of Atlanta. So how old are you when, when, when this is happening? That's from eight, uh, right before I turned eight. Uh, till 12 and uh, on my 12th birthday she was arrested uh, for selling drugs and narcotics and uh, after spending some time in, in DFACS, uh, Department of Family and Children's Services, uh, the courts awarded custody to my father. And at this point um, he had remarried and uh, so we went to live with him and, and I'm very grateful for my, especially my stepmom, for uh, whipping me into shape. I was really a Wall Street kid and 
they were attending a church, and so we began to go to that church, and uh, the following summer, there was a summer camp, and at that camp, uh, I remember sitting around the campfire and the pastor, associate pastor of the church talking about Jesus and why he came and how he died for our sins, but we have to receive him into our life. If you don't want to go to hell, I remember that was a piece of it. I didn't want to go to hell. So I asked Jesus into my life. It was a real thing. A distinct conversion moment. Yeah. And how old were you? I was 12. 12 years old. Uh, but then we hit, uh, the high school began. Sure. And I can almost tell the story now, can't <laughs> I? But, but you tell your story. Yes. Um, but on Sundays, I was in church. Uh, during the rest of the week, I was the perfect chameleon, depending on what group I was with. Yeah. Um, I acted like that group. But God began to get me. And during my uh, senior year of high school, I started going to uh, a ministry called Young Life. Yep. Which it. ministers to uh, uh, high school kids. And through the ministry of Young Life, came to see that, uh, yes, I'd asked Jesus in as my Savior, but I wasn't following Him as my Lord. And uh, I have some long stories about all of that. If you want to hear it, I'll share it. But uh, but came to the place where basically it was Jesus the Lord or my Lord. He's Lord of the universe, Lord of the church, Lord of all the animals, Lord of the creation, all of that. But is He my Lord? Is He the one in charge of my life? Is the one leading me, directing me, and I realized, no, I was. So what, what decisions at that moment, therefore, um, it's, I don't want to say a second conversion, but um, we often talk about that second stage where you actually go, actually, yes, he, he owns me. Right. And, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, what decisions then did you start to make in your life so your life would have looked different to, to the life of, the, of that pre that moment, Foley? Well, I remember I, I left church one Sunday. I went home that night and got on my knees, and I just said a simple prayer, Lord, I, I, I want to be all you want me to be. I want you to lead my life. I want you to be the Lord. Sh show me what that means. Now, uh, I don't call it a second conversion, but uh, all of a sudden this peace invaded my life. I would read my Bible, and it would speak to me. Um, I would pray, and I didn't feel like God was somewhere way up. I mean, He was here. And uh, I began to just live obediently the best I could, uh, following His will for my life. Uh, I remember at some point, uh, I mean, I used to drink a lot, and, uh, but because of the condition in my family, yeah. God brought me to the point, I remember specifically him, it, it was very clear, Lord, he, he said to me, uh, if you want to live a holy life, you're going to have to stop drinking, because you, the way you've been made, cannot handle the alcohol, yeah. and so I had to choose, and so that was a step I had to make. Another area was in the area of forgiveness. Sure. Uh, he brought me to a place of forgiving my mother. I was going to ask, it must be mom, right? Yeah, it must be mom. And it, it was. And uh, I remember him clearly saying, how can you ever get in a pulpit and talk about forgiveness uh, if you aren't going to forgive your mom? And then he, another thing he said to me, are, are, he said, are you happy with the person that I've made you to be? For the most part, I was. Yeah. He says, well, so how, how can you be arguing with me about this. I've made you. I've used all this for good. How can you hold this against her? Yeah. So when I consciously forgave her, uh, that's when I had kind of a, that's when the emotional thing. I, I didn't realize how much stuff was stuffed oh, down yeah. there. And uh, all the, all I really... baggage spilled yeah, out everywhere. I, yeah. I got so freed up. Um, but then that created problems on the other side of the family. Because oh, because you, you, how could you forgive her after all she's done? That exactly. Kind of okay. And and to forgive her meant I needed to have a relationship with her. What I didn't say was when she was arrested, the courts ruled that she couldn't see us for for six years. Yeah. So I opened that relationship back up. So on the father's side, all of a sudden that created issues. Yeah. So all well, that they're, they're church goers. Uh, they were. They're yeah. converted Christians. Yes. Yeah. They're now with the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it's still, still hard, isn't it? It yeah. is hard for some Christians just to forgive, exactly. even though we know we should. So now we're on the cusp of adulthood. Yes. We're 18 years old. Uh, we've had that realization that uh, Jesus really is in charge of my life. That's a good thing. Some things need to change. You've begun to build this relationship with your mother again. So the next natural step is, is, is college, university. Yes. Is, that, is that what happened? Yes, I Tell went to uh, Georgia State University, and I got involved in ministry. Um, yep. I just felt drawn to youth ministry. And so I got involved in the ministry of young life. Yeah. And uh, did that for years. Uh, but during my senior year of college, a uh, search committee from the Cathedral of St. Philip, which was a large Episcopal church in Atlanta, yeah. uh, called me to be their youth pastor. Okay. So 22 years old. Be I was actually 20 when they called 20, me. 20, wow. I, I turned 21 while I was working. 
Yeah. Um, but full-time youth pastor, and I worked there for seven years. And uh, we took a, a youth group of three and turned it into a youth group of a thousand some. Outstanding. You, and God just blew the socks off. I mean, it was just wonderful to be, to be used in that kind That's of way. Amazing. Were there any particular um, uh, men or women who, who were uh, uh, very um, influential in getting you into ministry? I know I've got a couple of men uh, back, in, back in London and, and, and in England. It was one of my greatest joys this week was to have dinner with them and just spend time with them again. Were there any people like that in, oh, that you can look to? to? Yeah, absolutely. And I see along the way different people he's used uh, to draw me in. Um, from pastors that I sat under their teaching mm -hmm. to folks who actually discipled me. Yeah. And it really made a big difference. Um, uh, I think of one man, too, that um, really ingratiated his, the philosophy of the Young Life ministry into me without me even realizing. His name is Danny Parker. But Young Life's specialty is to build relationships with kids who could care less about God. Right. And so to tune you in... So, so now I'm just automatically programmed in to yeah. the person around me that doesn't know the Lord. And how, yeah. how can I reach them? How can I reach out to What's them? What's the point of contact? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's fantastic. Now, where are we? We're, we're at the edge of, um, we've left university college. We're involved in pastoral ministry. We're not yet ordained. So what's the path now to ordination? We're one step in between there. One step in between. Tell me what that is. Um, I had to get confirmed. Oh. Well, actually, there's a couple of steps. And um, one of the things we would do with the youth is uh, we'd get their godparents involved in their confirmation. Well, after serving in the church for three years, I needed to be confirmed yeah. because I, I was pursuing ordination. And it hit me that I had godparents. Now, okay. Now, the only reason I remember I had godparents, and this is kind of bizarre, and, but it's true. Um, my mom, when we were, one of the places we lived, we lived out in the country, and the, the well pump went out on the, the house, so we couldn't pump water. So... We went to our godparents' house and stole the web pump, well pump. Yeah, they had some kind of country house or something. Stole it. Stole it. And that's how I remembered. It was <laughs> I a had, heist. <laughs> I didn't know, but I didn't know them. And so oh, okay. I started asking some Did questions. Did you know they were your godparents at the time? I remember, I remember her saying, these are your godparents. We're going to take, take that pump. Take <laughs> <laughs> That's bizarre. The statute uh, of limitations has long gone now. I, well, if I knew who they, you know, if I yeah. knew they were still alive, I would have made things right. But anyway, I didn't know them. I had never met them. But it turned out I'd been baptized in an Episcopal church as okay. a baby. Did yeah. not even know that. Okay. And so it's God brought me kind of like wow. full circle. But in the midst of that, I met my wife, Allison. Yes. Uh, the kids and the youth group actually set us up for our first date. Nice work. And well, you couldn't do this today, but we actually double dated with a couple in the youth group on our first date. Okay, nice. Is that bizarre? Where, where was that first date? Uh, it was, um, we went to a restaurant, which I won't name the restaurant. It was okay. really loud. I was a poor youth minister. I couldn't afford much. Okay. And then we went to a school play, a what, drama, a musical. What was the food, do you remember? Yeah, I had fried chicken. Yeah, I remember my first date with my wife. It was a Mexican food. Then we wanted to watch a film. Yeah. And what was the school play? Do you remember? I don't remember the school play. Okay. I was too grossed and hurt. And, and um, how long did it take you before you knew? Not long. Uh, I proposed after um, five months. Yeah, how was that? We were married. We, we were on our honeymoon a year from our first date. Nice work. So God, just he, we just knew. That's fantastic. And had you watched her from afar and said to your friends, that girl over there? No, actually, I, I didn't want anything to do with it. It's very interesting. Why not? I just wasn't. I, don't, I, I just wasn't attracted at first. Okay. But sure. but then once I started Clearly thinking, things changed. That's yes. right. Once I started thinking that way, <laughs> it all changed. That's fantastic. So that's that, 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 that's awesome. That's awesome. So you're getting married, uh, going to ordination. Take us take us through through the story. Then got confirmed. Got confirmed. And, and, and met up with your godparents again. Reestablished uh, with them. Only only a telephone call. Okay. That was it. Okay. Because they lived in another town now, and, and I just okay. didn't know them. Okay. And then into what? So when and where were you ordained? Um, I, w I went to s the University of the South in Swanee, Tennessee for seminary. Uh, in where, sorry? Uh, I'm sorry? Where, where, where was that? Uh, Swanee, Tennessee. It's called the University of the South. It's the Episcopal Seminary. Right. And that was quite an adventure. Yeah. Um, why is that? Well, there were just a few of us um, that were orthodox in the whole place. Okay. And... Uh, Fortunately, the next year, the cl that class behind us had more folks, and by the time we left, we had a good crew that we called the Swanee Evangelical Society. Nice. Did you know going into to seminary that it was going to be hard, that you were going to hear liberal theology, that you were going to have what you believe challenged? Were, were you prepared for that? 
I knew it would be challenging. I had no idea how challenging, yeah. or not, not challenging the right word, because I'd been in ministry long enough and I'd studied long enough. I knew how to, for the most part, defend it. Yeah. Um, but I was surprised to the degree of where it had, had where it went. Yeah. For example, my theological foundations course could have been called feminist theology huh. foundations. Yeah. And we couldn't call God Father. Yeah. Uh, if we called God Father, then yeah. if you didn't turn around and call God Mother, you were demoted a letter grade. Oh, wow. Or, or he or she. Did you have a, ever have a moment where you actually realized a grade was at stake and there was a real question about theological integrity or your grade and, and you had to gra grapple with that? I just worded it in a way that I just... Just cunning about it. Yeah, you I need just... to get through. It was like, yeah. ah, this isn't worth, you know. Yeah, that's good. So how many years of seminary? A three. And then ordained into which, which, which diocese? Uh, the Diocese of Atlanta. Okay. I was ordained a deacon and then a priest. Yep. And uh, I was sent, uh, the bishop said, if, if you're willing to go to St. Albans in Monroe, Georgia, okay. uh, I'll send you. And so we went and interviewed, felt a call, yep. and we served there for 11 years wow. until the bottom fell out of the Episcopal Church. Okay. So tell us about that transition then. Were you, you were one of those who who decided they had to leave, is that right? Yes. How long do you want me to go with this? I can well, really tell you. It's a great little story. We okay. won't go for too long, but um, it's well, interesting for people to know. Well, this. a couple of things. One is, um, and I look back on this and I think, boy, you were just something. Um, but general convention of the Episcopal Church was meeting. They were wrestling with this decision which, about... Which year is this? This is 2003. Oh, this is the, 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 the big one. And, yeah. uh, and so... Uh, they, they voted to go ahead and consecrate Gene Robinson. And, and the lovely thing about that, the timing in God's providence, was that because his election was so close to the General Convention, it had to be ratified in the General Convention. Right. So it was almost a crystallizing moment, wasn't it, for the Episcopal Church? I, I think so, clearly. So talk us through that. So it happens. Yep. It's on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I can't remember what day it was of the week, but my phone is ringing off the hearth. Sure. You know, these older people, what What has happened to our church? What? What? They just don't understand. Because it's all in the news. And yep. Of course, our people are aware of it. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do at church on Sunday? How am I going to address this? And so I'm out run, running on Friday night, and I'm praying, and I just hear, do the burial office for the Episcopal Church. Oh, wow. And so that's what we did. You had a funeral service for the Episcopal Church. Carried the, the candle, Sunday. all My the word. prayers for the, the, the one who died. Uh, it was so cathartic, uh, ministered to our people. Uh, I uh, preached a sermon, basically putting us in a discernment process as a church. Uh, the other piece of that for me personally was I was booked up with weddings and commitments all throughout the fall. And I knew if I tried to do any, first of all, I didn't have the time to really pray through and think through it. Yeah. But also I'd hurt people because they were counting on me. Um, so we put the church in a process and then the, the, the week between Christmas and New Year's, yep. uh, I always go off on a prayer retreat. Yep. And so I'd set it all aside to, to put, and I hadn't been with the Lord 15 minutes. Foley, the way you're made, you'll lose your soul if you stay in the Episcopal Church. Oh, wow. It was that clear. that clear. That clear. Secondly, you'll lose your children That's an to the faith. I, I keep hearing that, yeah, from many people. And so uh, it just it just became clear. So then the question was, all right, I knew I was leaving, but where? You have to go, and where? And what about the church family? Is that, is that uh, right? The, the church, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, okay. well, we've got time. <laughs> so, um, so I knew I had to go, and uh, a long story short, uh, later in that week, we were having dinner at a friend's house, and uh, Bishop Bill Atwood was there, and I, t I told him what I was wrestling with, and he said, well, uh, let me let you talk to Greg Venables. Uh, okay. And uh, Things were afoot, weren't they? And so then he put us in touch with Frank Lyons, and we basically interviewed each other, and within a matter of days, I was canonically resident in the Diocese of Bolivia. Outstanding. In the province of the Southern Cone at that time. So that was the early January, the, the first or second Sunday of January, I stood up in front of my parish and resigned. And I told them that uh, I was going to be planning another church uh, in the Anglican church. And I said, uh, I didn't invite anybody to come with me. I basically left it, this is between you and the Lord. I said, some of you will be called to be a part of this and some of you will not. You have to obey the Lord. How many people in the church at that time? That's a good question. Roughly. 400, 400 some. 400. Yeah. And so what happened to those 400 people? Uh, most of them ended up coming. Most of them ended up coming. Yeah. Or they went to other places. Sure. 
Where they were. And so, um, so three weeks later, we uh, set up uh, in a middle school cafeteria. We had two services with over 350 folks present that first Sunday. Um, but here's the other thing: is half of the people that were at that church service I didn't know. Wonderful. They came from other places. Yeah. Um, and that was the beginning of Holy Cross Anglican Church, which yeah. is now Holy Cross Cathedral uh, in Loganville, Georgia. Not in the cafeteria anymore. Not in cafeteria. No, we were there a, a year and a half. That's a whole other story, how God provided land, and we built a building, and uh, provided more land, and we yeah. built more stuff. I mean, God's really blessed. It's a total God story. I can't take any, any credit for it. Well, him. he's very good like that. Oh, he's we amazing. Do like him. Now, so eventually consecrated bishop, was that then in the ACNA itself? Yes, in 2009, when the ACNA was formed, uh, a group of us in the Atlanta area who had been in other, what we call our lifeboats, somewhere in Bolivia, yeah. somewhere in Rwanda, yeah. somewhere in Nigeria, is it time to form a diocese? And we, we got together, decided it was, went through the whole process, yep. and then... Uh, I became the bishop. I was elected bishop. And that's a whole other story about my decision to do that. So yeah. how are we doing on time? Well, I think we've got time for that because that's an important one. And then just a couple more things. So talk us through the process of becoming a bishop. Again, I'm, I'm sure that was daunting. Um, actually, the thing that's going through my head right now is I'm just imagining you starting at this little church in Georgia. You wouldn't imagine that you would be sitting maybe 15, what is it, 15, 20 years later in Jerusalem in a hotel having just been asked to be the chairman of, of the largest Anglican movement in the world. I mean, it's just an amazing Bizarre. thing. Like you say, a God's it's, story. It's totally a God's so story. So tell us about becoming a bishop. Well, people began to ask me, uh, Foley, we want to put your name in. We think okay. you ought to be the bishop. And I kept... I was thinking about forming this diocese. Right. And I said, no. I said, no. I'm, I do not want to be a bishop. I'm called to be a pastor. I want yeah. to teach the Word of God. I want to lead yeah. people to Jesus. Yeah. And Bishop David Anderson was coming to visit our parish one Sunday and he said Foley I'm having trouble with my back um, can I sit in the bishop's you mind if I sit in the bishop's chair to preach yeah. this morning yeah. well part of my issue had been and I don't know if Queen Elizabeth ever said this but yeah. somebody attributes, attributes it to her that when the co bishop's consecrated and the hands come up they pull yeah. the backbone just right out of the bishop right uh, you ever heard that? I've heard many people say okay. that. Yes. Rip your spine out yeah, from the exactly. back. Yeah, that's right. And that's been my experience. People that I've known and I've loved, and all of a sudden they become a bishop, and what's happened? And I didn't want that to happen. Sure. So anyway, he preaches this sermon, and I'm thinking, this is the great, that's the best I've heard him preach. And I commented to him afterwards, and then I said, you know, I've never seen the chair used for that. He said, well, Foley, that's what that chair is for. Yeah. To teach the Word of God. I remember when, um, I remember sitting in London at All Souls Langham Place and uh, Archbishop Peter Jensen uh, was invited to preach and he said, I'm an Archbishop. That means my job is to tell people about Jesus and make sure there's other ministers doing the same thing and Archbishop is just a bigger area. And we're like, yeah, that's what it is. That's what it is. Well, at that point, something clicked. Yeah. And then I went off on another prayer retreat and the Lord worked me over and took me to some verses that uh, he'd used to call me into ministry and yeah. showed how they would fit. In. Well, which are? I'm not getting into all that, no, but okay. I, I can, but it just gets a whole other level sure. of stuff. But all that being said, I allowed my name to be put in and okay. they, they elected me. So. They elected you, and that's fantastic. And then I think the rest of the story is, 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 is quite well known. Yeah. I've got two more questions for you. The first is, um, I don't know if you've been aware, uh, but there's been a little, uh, little subgroup of people following along on social media following along a thing, trying to get a thing called Fashions of Gafcon Up. <laughs> and it's, and it's, a, it's a hangover from an Australian thing called Fashions of Synod. That really? We started in, in Synod in Sydney and then extended to our general synod. That's hilarious. And, 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 um, and that makes me want to talk about this, this pectoral cross, which is quite unique. This is your unique contribution to Fashions of, of Gafcon. Tell us the story of the pectoral cross. Well, when I was consecrated bishop, there was a special friend that uh, donated some money to have this made for me. Yeah. And so a, a jeweler somewhere uh, crafted it and made it. I've never seen anything like it yeah. before. Uh, so you're asking me a fashion statement. I want to ask you a fashion. I think your audience needs to know what ah, the symbol is on well, your T-shirt. That's, that's really kind. I was wearing my, 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 my collared shirt for most of the day, uh, but at the final afternoon break, I, I ripped it off and put this on. This is symbolic of my week running the light, helping run the live stream. It's the caffeine molecule. 
<laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, there, there, there it is as well. Now, um, one small thing, then one final question. One, yes. I have never heard the name Foley ever anywhere else. Is, is it a common name in the South? Or, or, or it's is actually it, an, is Irish Irish name. Name. It's, an Irish it's, name. It was my grandmother's maiden name on my father's side. So yeah. the name that she had before she got married. Yeah. My middle name, Thomas, is yeah. my great-grandmother's name yeah. on my mother's side. Yeah. And that is a uh, Southern American tradition to uh, use family names and to the first name. Wow, that's wonderful. Now, last question. We began the story of your life uh, looking at, uh, at you as, as a baby and, and, and the family situation that, that, that you were in. Um, not, not the best. What's your family situation now? Tell us now about your family. Oh, I am so blessed. Yeah. I have an awesome wife. We've just, been, uh, just celebrated our 35th anniversary. Her name's Allison. Uh, she keeps me straight. She's got the gift of uh, prophecy. Uh, the kind that tells, you know, speaks the truth, you know, yeah. so she doesn't mind telling me like it is. We have two adult children. Yep. Uh, one is 29 and one's getting ready to be 27. Uh, they're great. They're walking with the Lord. And, uh, Are there any grandchildren yet? No, we, they, we're not married yet. They're not so, married yet. Okay. So uh, we're still working on that piece. I did ask them, I, we did say we'd like to have marriage ceremony before we have grandchildren. Yeah. 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 That's great. Archbishop Foley, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's a joy to be here. Bless Thanks. you. Bye.